question mark. So, Emmanuel, over to you. Right, thank you, Philip, and thanks, Malcolm, also for the invitation and for forcing me to look into a topic which um, reminded me that one of the first things I was told about utilitarianism was that it had nothing to do with any aesthetic theory. So <laughs> I hope this series of lectures is going to um, put things right. Right. Um, in the 1770s, the philosopher and French minister Turgot discussed the utilitarian doctrines of Helvetius in a series of letters with Condorcet, who was a mathematician and a philosopher, and also working with Turgot at the ministry. So after reminding his correspondent that calls to increase pleasure and minimize pains perver perverted morals, Turgot added that the principle of utility was unable to create emotion. The proof, he concluded, and that's a quote, is that men are moved by novels and tragedies, and that a novel whose main character conformed to the principles of Helvetius would, di would displease them. In Turgot's statement, like in most contemporary discussions on taste, moral values were strongly entwined with aesthetic judgment. Like morals, taste was shaped by society and allowed shared values to circulate and to grow. Peaceful manners, the rise of polite society, conversation between the sexes and the refinement of taste were marks of a high degree of civilization. Like many of his contemporaries, including, as we'll see, Helvetius himself, Turgo believed that those values had reached a high point in Enlightenment sociability. But according to him, the weight given to individual pleasure in utilitarianism threatened to subvert the consensus on which polite society rested. Fifty years later, when Bentham wrote the manuscripts making up sexual irregularities and not Paul but Jesus part three, the question of how to articulate utilitarianism and aesthetic judgment remained <coughs> relevant. As this paper shows, light may be thrown on the interplay between those fields by going back to earlier debates on both sides of the channel, but here I, um, as you'll see, most of my sources will be uh, from French authors. It's worth remarking at this point that the groundwork for sexual irregularities was led in the 1780s, a formative period in Bentham's thought, as the editors of the volume remind us in the introduction. So shortly after completing an introduction to the principles of morals and legislation, Bentham went back to the question of pleasure in the context of his work on reward, written, written, with manuscripts written both in French and in English, as well as uh, in another essay on place and time in matters of legislation. The destination of these manuscripts on these manuscripts on reward, which were used in this paper, and which were written both in French and in English around 1782, is not yet entirely clear. It is in those pages, however, that Bentham's most complete statements about aesthetic pleasures are to be found. One must immediately point out, however, that this topic only takes up a small fraction of what was planned as a much larger work, which is only in itself marginally concerned with aesthetic matters as such. So we're dealing here with a very small uh, share of Bentham's manuscripts on rewards. None of this material was published before 1811 in French and 1825 in English under the title Théorie de Récompense, or Theory of Reward, after editorial work conducted by the Genevan Étienne Dumont, who, is also, uh, who also figures prominently in this paper. The purpose of this paper, then, is to show that the Enlightenment debate on the role and the place of aesthetic pleasures within utilitarianism, utilitarianism not only shaped Bentham's own understanding of the moral value of taste in general, and of literature in particular, but also um, shaped Dumont's own reaction to the material. Finally, it's also against this background that the early reception of Bentham's ideas in the 1810s and the 1820s needs to be assessed in those two decades in which the foundations of moral and aesthetic judgment were being profoundly reshaped throughout Europe. So the first part of this paper looks at how morals and aesthetics are treated in Bentham's early works, and I think you've um, heard enough about this, on, uh, about this subject already to uh, be able to engage in, in a good 
um, discussion with what I'm going to present here. Um, and I'm going to attempt to locate Bentham's statement in the context of um, aesthetic reflection in the French Enlightenment. In displacing the context from the Anglophone to the Francophone sphere, I think that we can more clearly locate Bentham's specific position. So I'm, as I, wa uh, I want to make clear that I add, and I do not, uh, I'm not saying that there's only one context which is relevant to read and understand Bentham's manuscripts, and in that respect, uh, Malcolm's work on Bentham and Hume, uh, and Hume um, is relevant, but I'm thinking we can actually understand things differently when we shift the angle of, uh, through which we read the text. The second part turns to the, the early reception of Bentham's ideas. It explains first on which terms Etienne Dumont, so his Genevan friend and editor, read the material, drawing on manuscripts, uh, unpublished manuscript from Dumont. And the last part has to do with the, res the reception of those ideas in Madame de Stael's writings in the 1810s. So this paper is primarily focused on the issue of artistic pursuits, especially literature. But through the description, for instance, of amorous relationships in literary works, the issue of sexual morality irrigates this debate. So this is not something I'm going to explain here or develop, but I'm, I think it's part of the same um, subject, and maybe we can discuss it um, later on. Right, so um, I'll turn now to an overview of what I take to be the most uh, salient points of Bentham's early views on arts and literature. As it's been noticed um, quite often, aesthetic pleasures seem to be conspicuously absent from Bentham's published works. In chapter five, for instance, of an introduction to the principles of morals and legislation, his most famous work, written in 1780, Bentham lists the different kinds of pains and pleasures, but there is no mention as a separate source of pleasure of aesthetic sensibility. Music is mentioned, but Bentham develops the well, sees music uh, from the point of view of the, um, of the player, from the, uh, it's the pleasures of performing music which count, and it's not the pleasures of the audience. Uh, in a similar way, when he describes the complex pleasures of a country scene, he, his description is centered around the enjoyment afforded by the sights, the smell, and the sounds of nature, but not, those of, but not the pleasures, pleasures of representation. For Bentham's ideas on the arts, we must turn to his writings on rewards. And the location of uh, this topic within a work on reward can be discussed, but it has to do mostly with the fact that arts for, and the fine arts in general for Bentham are sources of pleasure. And in a work devoted to how the legislator can use sources of pleasure to maximize general utility, um, there is, it's relevant to talk about the fine arts. The fine arts are, um, appear in this work in a variety of ways. Um, here I'm going to look at how Bentham, um, well, at what he, he says about the arts first as a source of pleasure, then uh, in how he looks at the political dimension of the arts, and lastly how he conceives of um, what he does with the argument that arts can be a means to an end. Right, so first the, the fine arts as a source of pleasure. So Bentham in this work mentioned and defined the fine arts in the context of a broader typology of useful pursuits. Being sources of pleasure, the fine arts should be encouraged by the utilitarian legislator. In this respect, Bentham mapped out the field of what he calls the agreeable arts and sciences, or the fine arts, in which he included music, poetry, so I'm going to say more about poetry later, painting, sculpture, architecture, gardening, and games in general. For a utilitarian <coughs> like Bentham, the pleasures uh, afforded by the arts need to be taken into account. So this can, we can set this attitude against that of Rousseau, for instance, who in the letter to D'Alembert maintained that the, the present ban on theatres should be maintained in Geneva. Bentham um, 
on the contrary, considered that no pleasure should be considered as an evil and should be forbidden by the legislator. Enjoyment should not, sources of enjoyment should not be prescribed. But should legislators actually actively promote and encourage the fine arts? In fact, the principles of utilitarian psychology, while allowing the legislator to recognize pleasure, also set strict limits to his intervention. Indeed, in an introduction to the principles of morals and legislation, Bentham had reminded his readers that the faculty to derive pleasure from this or that pursuit depended on what he called circumstances of influencing sensibility, which varied from one individual to another. Uh, as far as the fine arts were concerned, the role of the government was not directly to provide pleasure to individuals, but to support contributions which had a beneficial impact on the public in general. This um, is important because it excluded um, an encouragement of the arts which could um, lead to um, supporting arts or form of arts which procured pleasure to only one patron or one amateur and, or to only one class of people and that's, the, that's what Bentham makes clear when he includes games of all sorts in the same category as the fine arts. He opens up the social sphere of enjoyment to all classes. So, that's bring, so that brings me to my second, um, to the second dimension I want to discuss, which is that of aristocratic pleasures. So as far as this issue of uh, pleasures and the aristocracy is concerned, the parallel with, with Rousseau becomes relevant um, again. Um, what they have in common is that both have a strongly anti-aristocratic approach to the arts. So it's by bearing the political meaning of arts in mind that we can better understand Bentham's refusal to admit of a hierarchy between pleasures, which continued to shock and puzzle John Stuart Mill. In fact, at the time, well, until today, a convincing utilitarian case could be made and was made at the time for improving the taste of the public in general by educating the public, uh, so the people in general, to appreciate the fine arts. Examples of this may be found in the writings of Helvetius, so he was one of the philosophers most admired by Bentham and an acknowledged source of um, his ideas. In a posthumously published poem entitled Happiness, Helvetius wrote that the philosopher, and that's a quote, does not abandon the pleasures of the senses, but he masters them. Poetry, music, painting, sculpture, and architecture provide him new sources of pleasure. The word interest it's itself, as um, Reinhard Koselek pointed out, was jointly used at the time in the moral and in the aesthetic field in the 18th century. And this is something which is very present in Helvetius's writing. A painting pleases us because it interests us. We have an interest in this painting. So the vocabulary, again, is the same. Once this was recognized, the role of a legislator who was eager to increase the pleasures of the people should be to increase the number of those who could appreciate the fine arts. What's more, and Elvisius went as far as this, in a political system organized around the principle of interest, common tastes provided a guarantee that the citizens shared similar interests and sources of pleasure. So social cohesion was uh, promoted in a utilitarian system by the promotion of a good taste. But contrary to those who believed that the taste of the people should be improved and refined, which implied rules of taste and people in charge of making them known, Bentham had only harsh wor words for those who, tried those who attempted to do this. And this is in this slide that his statement on Addison can be understood. Uh, Addison, for Bentham, that's a quote again, distinguished himself by his skill in the art of ridiculing enjoyments by attaching to them the fantastic idea of bad taste. It's by criticizing critics, Bentham was doing nothing original because this was a familiar argument um, in the debates on taste in the period. But, um, so it's something that Voltaire also did. But uh, Voltaire was criticizing critics in order to promote good criticism over bad criticism. There was always this idea that um, one could distinguish between valid literary critic and, uh, and, and wrong or distasteful one. So Bentham's point was different. Uh, by imposing any given standard of taste, 
critics robbed a share of the public of their pleasure. In such a comparison, which could be further developed, uh, Bentham's strong focus on individual appreci uh, appreciation against collective enjoyment stands out. This is important because in that period, as has been studied by um, many historians, the rise of public discussions on the arts was a decisive moment in the structuring of a public sphere. So, Bentham, uh, so for Bentham, the arts seem to play no such role. They only illustrate the confiscation of power by a self-proclaimed elite, the nobility or self-proclaimed critics. Um, so I think we shouldn't underestimate how specific Bentham's position in this re was in this respect. Another way of looking at this is when we look, even if, if we want to keep a utilitarian focus, we want to look at the arts as means to an end. So Bentham even further refused to consider the fine arts as means to an end. Um, so this could all, uh, also be justified by a, by, uh, a utilitarian approach to, to the arts. This is especially clear in his treatment of poetry. In the manuscripts, the only, and well, poetry is the only artistic pursuit that he examines in any detail, concluding, as is well known, not only that Pushpin is in most cases as good as poetry, but that it is to be preferred to poetry. But for Helvetius, again, Diderot and Beccaria, among many others, poetry and eloquence were good when they reinforced the valuable impressions made on the public. Like any other tools, they could be considered as means to an end. In sharp contrast, Bentham singled out poetry as intrinsically corrupting, especially because of its closeness to political power. Through flattery and exaggeration, the poets encouraged the lowest in instincts in rulers, and Voltaire himself, whom Bentham otherwise admired, had done precisely that in courting Frederick II of Prussia's martial instincts. Secondly, for Bentham, poetry was always at odds with truth. In a manuscript fragment in English this time, Bentham explained, the felicity of life and the perfection of happiness and virtue depend upon the accuracy of our information and the rectitude of our judgments with relation to several topics we're interested in. But the tendency which poetry has to promote such accuracy and that rectitude is not very rem remarkable. On the contrary, the tendency it has, at least in most branches, in all perhaps but the dramatic, seems to be rather on the other side. Um, I haven't said, I haven't found much to, sub to substantiate Bentham's uh, proviso, but the dramatic, uh, but this is perhaps something we could discuss later. Apart from poetry then, did Bentham believe that the fine arts had any moral value? It would seem not. Developing the idea that Pushpin was in many cases better than poetry, he pointed out that, the quote again, the kind of morality and utility and merit which belong indiscriminately to all the arts and sciences is only a harmless employment of time. So in so doing, Bentham turned against the powerful parallel draw, draw, drawn by his contemporaries between the field of morals and the field of aesthetics. He seemed to ignore how closely um, this view could be articulated with consequentialist and utilitarian arguments. I want to quote here uh, from uh, Dolbach, who had written, for instance, that we like a beautiful act of antiquity because we feel its utility, because we put ourselves in the place of the man who committed it and of those who witnessed it or were the objects of it, because we would like the men amongst whom we live to behave in a similar way. He concluded that taste in morals does not differ from taste in the arts. Dolbach, and we could also discuss uh, how uh, Dolbach could be taken as a source of Bentham's uh, ideas, but uh, maybe later. Um, Dolbach was um, pointing out the connection between good taste in morals and good taste in the arts um, with a view to explicitly connect reflection on the origin of taste, both in morals and in the arts. For him, it was a mistake to believe that taste was innate or that we were innately geared to perceive what was good and beautiful. And in both spheres, taste had to be shaped through education and habit. This is also a position that we found in, Hel in Helvetius. Uh, 
he concluded, we can become connoisseurs in morals, just as we become connoisseurs in painting, in sculpture, in architecture, and so on. And for him, the connoisseur was the utilitarian who was able to shape his judgment according to train himself to think according to utility. Um, a similar line of thought can also be found in the research of the nature of style published by Cesare Beccaria, another avowed source of Bentham for another work, in 1780, in which he attempted to develop a utilitarian reflection on taste and style. And this is also something we could discuss at a later stage. To conclude this first part, and even if we narrow down, as I tried to do, the study to authors close to Bentham, at least in spirit, and which he, he acknowledged directly or not as sources, the specificity of his position stands out. So why does he refuse any legitimacy to public opinion in matters concerning aesthetic and sexual tastes? Um, if I can make a hypothesis here, I would try to explain that the roots of his view might lie in his theory of language. So this, I was drawn to this conclusion by his position on, on poetry. Um, words and the poetic use of words had a pivotal function in 18th century aesthetics. After the, the work of Etienne de Condillac, it was widely believed that primitive language was the direct product of emotion and sensation, and not of reflection. What we perceive, we perceive at once. Condillac believed that early languages reflected this simultaneousness of perception. He also went on to say that the first humans were poets, because their language directly mirrored their immediate perceptions and conveyed several ideas and sentiments at the same time. He found a proof of this in the way Greek and Latin functioned as languages, and especially there's a and his demonstration was about was about the syntax of Greek and the syntax of Latin. This is known as the theory of inversion. Um, this idea continued to be influential into the 19th century. And we can quote a contemporary of Bentham, who is the Frenchman Cabanis, um, who explained that the fine arts predated the intellectual development of reason and of language. In contrast, when Bentham wrote on the origins of language, for instance, in an appendix in Appendix 9 to Christomathea, he, su he suggested another narrative. For him, the true unit of meaning was not emotion or sensation, but a complex thought process which associated analysis analysis and synthesis, and resulted in the, propos in the production of a, propos of a proposition with logical connections. The basic, the basic unit of meaning was therefore a logical process, not an emotional response. Instead of admiring Latin and Greek for their direct appeal to emotions, Bentham praised the English language, which fulfilled, he wrote, all the purposes of discourse taken together. It's therefore not surprising that in the list of desirable properties in a language, dignity and patheticalness, the qualities associated with poetry, should appear last. So that's in 13th and 14th position respectively, the first all having to do with clarity. Note that Bentham's understanding of the arts has been tentatively mapped out and explained. It's possible to highlight what I believe is the true specificity of Bentham's position and to start examining its implications, even though it's not something I, um, I do here. Throughout, Bentham seems intent on keeping taste at the level of the individual, refusing to consider it as a social or collective form of appreciation, and therefore also refusing to establish any hierarchy between them, and the two are connected. Hence his consistent rejection of taste as opinion or caprice, so from his early writing of the 1780s to sexual irregularities. There's no common or exterior standard of taste in art or in sexual behavior. Utility is strictly to be measured on the level of the individual or of groups or communities bound by mutual consent. But there's no, um, but, the, but, there's n but there's nothing the society can say about it, about taste. I don't think that Bentham thoroughly addressed the potentially contradictory or anarchical implications of such a view. In his political and social thought, which, have, which has to come first due to the length of time and reflection he devoted to, um, to this side of his theory, he focused on collective utility. Um, his theory of taste is therefore to be understood within the framework of a social and political organization which supersedes it, 
how the two levels can effectively work together still needs to be further studied. And I don't think there is necessarily a complete contradiction between um, utility as an individual pursuit and utility as a collective and political pursuit, but I'm, um, I'm thinking we must go further in exploring how the two level um, uh, overlap and when, when they don't in some specific cases. Right. Uh, I wanted to point out um, how specific Bentham's ideas, not only on taste, but also on literature and the arts in general, uh, were, because uh, it helps us understand how um, those ideas were received by his contemporaries. So I look at two examples here. Uh, as I said, first Etienne Dumont, and then uh, Madame de Stal. Dumont was a friend of Bentham, and he received Bentham's manuscripts on reward in July 1794 from his correspondence. We know that he worked on them in the summer of 1807. Their contents, as I said, came out in Théorie des Peines et des Récompenses in 1811. Despite Dumont's usual disclaimer in the preface that he has partly rewritten Bentham's words, and that Bentham is not to be accountable for the ideas in the book, uh, an examination of the manuscripts proves him to have, to have been extremely faithful to the originals. He reproduced passages in which Bentham warned against the lure of poetry, an instrument of falsehood and false morals. He included the passages on the civilizing, on the civil, civilizing tendency of games in general, as well as Bentham's criticism of literary critiques in general, and of Addison in particular. It's, however, in a footnote to precisely this passage that Dumont hinted to a possible disagreement with Bentham's position. I couldn't, he wrote, adopt the author's position that in matters of literary taste there is no right nor wrong. But it's not in this footnote, it's not in print that he developed his own views. On the contrary, in the rest of the footnote, he in fact supported Bentham's views and adapted them to the cultural references of his francophone readers, substituting Boileau for Edison, for instance, and quoting French plays as an example uh, going in Bentham's directions. So if we want to know what Dumont really thought, we need to turn to his manuscripts, which fortunately offer fuller developments. In one of his notebooks, Dumont discussed this passage, the, well, the passage in Bentham's manuscripts more fully and came to the defense of literary critics. As we remember, Addison's crime, according to Bentham, had been to pour con contempt on popular word games and literary, and, and literary w w witticisms and mocking those who enjoyed them. In so doing, and while clarifying, I think, Bentham's reference to Addison, he immediately distinguished his own views uh, from his. Where Bentham had criticized critics as spoiled sports, Dumont insisted on the, useful, on the usefulness of literary criticism as a genre. So again, we have the utilitarian argument in defense of the fine arts. So Bentham, as we saw, believed that critics inflicted pain on the authors they attacked. Dumont argued that bad publicity was better than no publicity and that controversies made the spectators flood into the theaters. Dumont's point was not about literary merit in itself, but on the excitement and animation brought about by literary quarrels, which we know were such a defining feature in 18th century cultural life. By looking at the effect of controversies on sales, Dumont took Bentham's utilitarian reasoning into a new direction. He also legitimated the idea that the, that the literary field was central to understand the formation of public opinion, an idea which we saw was alien to Bentham. But Dumont also explored other directions, which send us back to the debate we have partly analyzed in part one. First, he rephrased Bentham's opinion as, there is no good or bad taste, or rather all tastes are good unless they are contrary to utility. And uh, the point is question, in question is truly the second half of the statement. What does it mean to say that um, there are no good or bad tastes unless they are contrary to utility? But he, that's not what he develops. Um, the point I want to make here is that the lines along which Dumont examined this argument reveal how deeply indebted to Rousseau he remained. So I've already mentioned Rousseau because in his letter to D'Alembert, he had famously argued against the frivolousness of the theater, which for him debased the moral and the political character of citizens. 
and was therefore not suited to uh, a small state republic uh, like Geneva. Um, Dumont directly echoed this argument. He supposed two men of equal talent and imagined that one of them was educated in a society in which only literary witticisms were valued, while the other was brought up to read what he called serious and philosophical books. After 20 years, Dumont continued, uh, the difference will be blatant. One of them will have turned into a frivolous wit and the other into what Dumont hope, uh, called a useful man, or one ready to be useful. Society, he continued, needed laborers, not rope dancers and conjurers. Where Bentham praised the harmless pleasures of Pushpin, Dumont lambasted games that, he wrote, prolonged childhood into the mature age. Dumont did not, however, consider that all artistic pleasures were intrinsically corrupting. There were good and bad poems, good and bad novels, and taste was, of course, the crucial and legitimate discriminating principle at work. So what was bad poetry, according to Dumont? It was formal and convoluted. On the contrary, good verses increased the force of true moral sentiments. So there's, no, so there's nothing new about uh, those arguments which praise poetry as the perfection of the use of language, a language, language put, um, used to persuade, to memorize, and above all, to feel. And these are all points uh, made by Dumont. Dumont's manuscripts prove uh, simultaneously how much he imbibed from Bentham on the one hand, and how far he still remained from wholeheartedly accepting the moral implications of his utilitarianism. He did follow Bentham, for instance, so just to, so, to show the fine line that he tried to walk, he did follow Bentham in attacking writers driven by, um, aesthetic, by, sorry, by um, asceticism, sympathy or antipathy, which he called despots, intent on persecuting those who did not follow their views. Um, and he provided his own examples of how literature could be used to confirm prejudices and to blind the reasons uh, of readers. Like Bentham, he believed that acting according to utility meant renouncing rhetoric in order to appeal to reason and to facts, especially in politics. However, he did not believe the same way when he uh, wrote about literature. In literature, the idea of the sublime remained a valid one, and Good literature was good when it, when it was untainted by false principles. So there could be good literature when it was not driven by asceticism or antipathy and when it promoted useful ideas. Throughout Dumont's, man, uh, sorry, throughout Dumont's manuscripts, Rousseau's style was repeatedly mentioned as an unsurpassable model to, to illustrate those desirable qualities, which were moral qualities and not political ones. After Dumont's death in 1829, the Bibliothèque de Genève, a periodical, published two short articles drawn from his manuscripts on Rousseau. There, Dumont argued that in literary matters, Rousseau's weaknesses in logics turned into strength and his stylistic genius approached perfection. So he therefore pitted the dry and dangerous style of the social contract against the charming and educating uh, scenes of Julie or the New Heloise or of Les Milles. According to Rousseau, Moral should be felt, not calculated, and his, in his manuscripts and in those published articles, uh, Dumont truly agreed. Dumont's philosophical itinerary has been described by Cyprian Blumeyeris as a move from Rousseauism to Bentham. If we follow Richard Watmore's conclusions in a, recent art, in a more recent article, in politics, Dumont's estrangement from Rousseau's ideas seems to have been clear since the aftermath of the terror in the mid-1790s. But Whitmore also pointed out that Dumont was fre frequently drawn back to Rousseau and engaged with his ideas throughout his life. This remark, I think, gains new currency when we look at his moral and aesthetic ideas and not only at his position in politics. But separating Rousseau's morals from his politics went against the avowed intention of the author of Rousseau himself. Moreover, as his papers tes testify, Dumont operated a similar disjunction in the case of Bentham's morals, which he rejected, and that's also so true. So we know that he didn't agree with his idea on taste, and we uh, also have clues to, he, um, to the fact that he disagreed with the little he knew about Bentham's ideas on sexual morality, but that's another topic. Um, 
So he rejected some aspects of Bentham's thought while consistently continuing to praise um, his system and his model of his social science in politics. Whether Dumont's understanding of the political and moral implications of, of Bentham's system was correct or not is not in question here. And as we'll see soon, when Dumont was pushed to take sides in public, he chose Bentham. But his example shows how deeply those issues, the aesthetic issues, per permeated the reception of Benthamite utilitarianism, even among close disciples. And again, uh, John Stuart Mill comes to mind when we think of another way uh, in which uh, someone close to Bentham's idea could react to his ideas on taste. These debates also permeated the reception of Bentham's utilitarianism in the following years. So in the last section, I want to focus on the figure of Germaine de Stahl and point out the fact that her views were considerably more influential than Dumont's because they were, unlike his, widely publicized. Uh, Dumont's writings were, to my knowledge, never, uh, well, his own ideas of taste, except in the essays on Rousseau, remained unpublished. So unlike Dumont, who chose to reject Bentham's aesthetics and morals, but decided to accept his politics, uh, Madame de Stal believed that the moral and the aesthetic flaws of utilitarianism directly undermined political society and revealed the unsuitability of utilitarianism as a whole. So a few words uh, about uh, Madame de Stal, uh, whose writings spanned uh, the period from 1788 to 1817, uh, and which exemplify another way in which utilitarian aesthetics could be received against the Rousseauist background. She was the daughter of Jacques Necker, twice finance minister to Louis XVI, and a wealthy Genevan banker. She embraced the literary career early on and became one of the most influential French language writers in the 1790s through to her death um, in her 50s in uh, 1817. Her first published work was precisely on, on Rousseau. It was called Letters on the Writings and the Character of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, published in 1788, and those letters provided in more ways than one the model for Dumont's own essays on Rousseau. The themes and the lines of thought are similar. Before Dumont, she considered Rousseau's politics impracticable and dangerous, but she abundantly praised his style in close connection with his moral thought. As Dumont later did, she subscribed to the idea that morals when it were in incarnated in Rousseau's literature and were served by a style which appealed to sentiments rather than reason. But she went further. In morals, eloquence and sentiment provided a safeguard against two dangers. On the one hand, the slow calculations on the, of the mind, and on the other, the hasty and dangerous passions of the heart. Rhetoric was good, because, and it was necessary in the service of virtue. Eloquence and good rhetoric served to develop the sentiments which allowed individuals, and that's a quote, to tap the resources they find in themselves, those of friendship, family love, and intellectual pleasures. So it had a regulating, it served a regulating function. Literary fictions in this respect had a central part to play, a theory which uh, Madame de Stal put into action by writing novels, moral novels like Corinne or Delphine. Literature for her was the true vehicle of morals. In an essay entitled On Literature, she insisted on the powers of style when it gave rise to moral and aesthetic sentiment together. She wrote, independently, and that's the important point, independently from the examples they bring to view, literary masterpieces move us physically as well as morally, shivers of admiration, prepare us for generous actions. By fortifying sentiment, good literature developed moral sensibility. Madame de Stal insisted uh, perhaps a little like Dolbach had done, uh, that the same mental processes were at stake in identifying with the hero of a novel and with making one's own moral decisions in real life. By placing characters in specific circumstances and illustrating their moral quandaries, novels acted as a training ground for decision-making. She went further. Moral value was in the style itself as much as in the fictitious actions depicted. She wrote that the process at work in the choice of words was the same by the author, 
was the same as that which led to the choice of actions by the characters. In this way, so when an author chooses a word, he chooses the right word, and that's equivalent to choosing the right action. In this way, style regained in her writings a central moral function. So we see how uh, late Enlightenment themes that had been around for years were united in her writings into a consistent aesthetic, moral, and political theory. Madame de Stal and Dumont knew each other well. He was a regular guest at Coupé, her residence in the vicinity of Geneva. In the summer of 1807, as Dumont was working on Bentham's manuscripts on reward, he received from her a copy of her novel, Corinne or Litaly, which had just, just been published. Madame de Stal was also acquainted with the extract from Bentham's works, which Dumont had published in Genevan periodicals. And um, after the publication of the Traité de Législation Civile et Pénale in 1802, extracts were read at Coupé and discussed. It's, uh, I must say something, in order to understand her position more uh, clearly, I, I must first explain, before explaining what Madame de Stal did not like about utilitarianism, I need to explain what, why she believed that it was worth discussing or considering as a political theory. But I'll do that briefly. Um, Bentham's ideas interested her because they provided, or they seemed to provide, an answer to a question which was at the heart of her reflection on contemporary politics after the revolution. How can we build a society which um, avoids the danger of the revolution and still maintains um, common purpose? She did not reject all calculation and political engineering from the sphere of politics, but she believed that what was true for the mass was inherently incorrect in the case of individuals. It's a paradox which, is, which she formulated as a conflict between the legislator and the moralist, using, so it's also a, a division that Bentham uh, used in his writings, um, defining different spheres of action for the legislator and for the moralist. Madame de Stal wrote, the legislator takes men together the moralist one by one. The legislator must act on the nature of things, the moralist on the diversity of sensations. Lastly, the legislator must always examine men from the point of view of their mutual relationships. The moralist considers each individual as a moral entity, a compound of pleasures and pains, of passions and reason. He sees man in different forms, but never separates him from himself. Only, so in, in order to resolve this uh, necessary conflict between individual and society, we needed to find another way of um, creating a political, of making a political society function. For her, it was only literature, by appealing to what was primarily human in men and women, it was only literature who, which could transcend the opposition of individual interests and bring men and women together in a community of feelings. When she read Kant's writings in the early 1800s, and Madame de Stal was one of the first uh, European intellectuals to discuss and comment on German philosophy, and she made Kant's ideas known in France. Um, so she read Kant's writings in the early 1800s, and this had a profound impact on her not least because it allowed her to take her views of the connections between aesthetic and moral judgment one step further. Um, this also, her, her discovery of Kant uh, also had to do with her personal position. In the first decade of the 19th century, her position in France became da dangerous as her public hostility to Napoleon's rule grew and became <coughs> very public. She rejected the opportunism of many of her French contemporaries who had adapted to the increasing violations of liberty under the terror and the empire, and she repeatedly attacked the utilitarian calculations which she believed had served to justify them. Kant's work allowed her to propose an alternative aesthetic, moral and political theory, and to support her, re her rejection of enlightenment materialism as a whole. Tellingly, it was Kant's definition of the sublime which provided the key to individual liberty against all forms of political coercion. Enthusiasm was innate, it was like duty. Acknowledging beauty when we saw it showed our common humanity and our drive to preserve something individual and something good. 
Enthusiasm was the realization of individual sensibility and humanity, but also connected men and women to the shared treasures of mankind. It was therefore the only proper foundation for a political society of free individuals. This led Madame de Stal to provide in De l'Allemagne, uh, on Germany, a long criticism of the principle of utility in which she directly argued against Bentham's arguments as made public by Etienne Dumont. This confrontation was also physically played out in real life in, Lond in London salons in 1813, shortly after On Germany came out. Banned from France and under threat in Geneva, Madame de Stael reached London after a long journey through Germany and Northern Europe. During her stay, she was received in Wick salons, especially at Burwood, by, th by the third Marcus of Lansdowne. Her visit was documented in some detail by Etienne Dumont, who was also a frequent guest at Burwood and in Wick circles, and had been since the late 1780s, and who was therefore, as a Genevan, a perfect uh, host and for Madame de Stal, his fellow Genevan. So Dumont was there, um, accompanied Madame de Stal in most of her uh, social outings in London. In these conversations, Oh, so in the public conversations in London salons, and despite the views which I presented earlier as Dumont's own views, Dumont un un unambiguously defended Bentham's utilitarianism on moral and political grounds rather than on aesthetic ones. He, as he recalled in his letters to, uh, to Maria Edgeworth, whose novels incidentally also attempted to put utilitarian morals into practice in a work of fiction, Dumont soon made, made it clear that he wasn't to be drawn into public quarrels on the subject of utilitarianism, and that he'd given up trying to persuade Madame de Stael or even to argue with her. He went on, To define according to her is to kill. Moral classifications are not better than anatomy. One builds a skeleton, and when one tells it, rise up and walk, it cannot move. This is her point, and she will not be brought to depart from it. So Dumont stopped arguing with Madame de Stael in public about utilitarianism, um, and I'd like to conclude on that. The impossible dialogue between Madame de Stael and Dumont was an important step in the radicalization of positions which had been closely intertwined since the second half of the 18th century. One should not underestimate the force and the influence of Madame de Stael's arguments against utilitarianism, both in print and in person, uh, and that's true uh, also, and perhaps especially true in England, because it's on those arguments that uh, Carlyle uh, built on in, in his 1827 essay for the Edinburgh, Edinburgh Review entitled State of German Literature, and he acknowledges Madame de Stael's uh, on Germany as a source, though he kind of, he's not very kind to her. Um, Though in this essay, Carlyle does not mention Bentham directly, he evidently had English utilitarians in mind as well as French ones when he wrote about those who, and that's a quote, set up utility for the universal measure of mental as well as material value and believe that poetry, except of an economical and preceptorial character, is the product of a rude age. Those people he called the Philistines. As we know, the attack against Philistines was taken up later by Ruskin and directed this time against English utilitarians in general, sparking a fruitful debate with John Stuart Mill on precisely those issues. So questioning the connection between aesthetics and utilitarianism, as this series of conferences illustrates, uh, I hope, uh, shows that it's far from a marginal topic. In fact, it goes at the heart of, utilitarian of utilitarianism itself and can be shown to have been a major theme throughout the history of the doctrine and not something just um, on the side. From Turgot to Carlyle, the connection between utilitarianism and aesthetic feeling was questioned in a variety of ways. Interestingly, those criticisms also came from within liberal and reforming circles. Um, so to open up the discussion, I can conclude that the challenges that Bentham's radical individualism in matters of taste, um, uh, sorry, the challenges which Bentham's radical individualism in matters of taste pose to the foundations of utilitarianism, of utilitarianism still need to be further explored. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.
Thank you, Manuel. That's a, a brilliant paper. And um, let's open up the, um, the floor for questions. Go ahead. It's moderation, isn't it? Moderation? <laughs> moderation is the crime for Bentham. Because it's not, and this is what you're saying with Distel, that what she's saying is how can we achieve this perfect balance where aesthetics and virtue form each other? And to my mind, what Bentham rejects in taste is precisely that co-option mm -hmm. of art and feeling for moderation and balance. It's the same in Hume, that sense of finding the, the right position, which is essentially what might call an emergent bourgeois position, <coughs> mm -hmm. where you, know, you, uh, you get your esteem from character, not from birthright. Um, that I think what Bentham's saying is not, it's not anti-feeling, it's anti that transformation of feeling into social virtue by this violence of moder you know, violent attempt to moderate and find a balance. I think what Bentham wants is, I think once F Philip referred to, I don't know what passage is in, but uh, the smell of a tramp. <laughs> I mean, what Bentham wanted was precisely the feeling, but without moderation. And it was ta taste for him was moderation. Yeah, I, I agree with this, but this, uh, to my mind, leaves the question of how my violent feelings, well, or the place of my own violent feelings uh, in society. They, they are your, Bentham would say they are your own, and we should find a way to make those, to give space to, to you and whatever it is you... Uh, because we, and ultimately, I think it says in deontology, we can't know what, what is pleasure for you or what's pleasure no. for me. You can't know what's pleasure for me. I can't know that. Therefore, we've got to find a way in a sense, not to, to make the next leap into saying, well, though we've got to, we've got to find a, a, a social mutual position based on pleasure, because well, you can't, because it's not, it's not, our pleasures are not commensurable in that sense. No, they're not commensurable, so, but um, I'm not disagreeing with this. Um, I'm saying that this is an extremely radical position. Yeah, it's right, an yeah. extremely <laughs> radical position, and Bentham, to my knowledge, doesn't provide any easy way of actually doing this in no. a utilitarian political society. No. He, um, his arguments for for this, we've got to leave the field of literature uh, and look at, well, for instance, at his uh, arguments. Um, in the field of sexual morality, what he says about homosexuality, it's not convincing at all. I mean, if 